Okay, this is where we ended off last time. So, just for a reminder, for those of you who had lab yesterday, um, we probably would have covered what we're covering today on Wednesday if it had not been canceled, so you were a little bit behind, but you'll, it'll, you'll be fine. So this is where we ended off last time, just talking about a little bit difference than what we're seeing here with the Hello World. And you'll notice first that it looks like the Python one's simpler, but you know, Python is one hiding a lot of the, the boilerplate code. And when I was saying boilerplate code before, what I meant was some of the code that just kind of has to be there. It's not overly functional for what we're thinking about right now. Where Java is not, and there is definitely some verbose, more verboseness to Java, but at the end of the day, there's really not much difference here between the two pieces of code. When you look at line two in the Python, it says print hello world. And then on line four in the Java, you see system.out.println, ln for line, print line, hello world. That's, that's how you print. So those are the parts that are functionally the same. What's different here is in Java, everything has to be in a class. It has to be. And in Java, now this hello world didn't need to be in the main method. We could have put it somewhere else. But ultimately, when we hit run, on a Java program, and really for Python too, just Python kind of hides this from you, in a lot of other programming languages, when you hit run, the first line of code that's run in all of your program, you have a billion lines of code in your project, but the first line of code that's going to get run is the first line in the main method. So the code here that we wanted to run is just print hello world, so that's line one of the main method. And the main method needs to be called main. It has to be, lowercase m. So that's what public static void main string args is. Main is the important thing here. <clears throat> but there's a lot of words here that, there's a lot of like keywords here that you might not be overly familiar with. Some of them you are, some of them you aren't. The first one we'll talk about is class. Class is a keyword that you've already seen in Python. You want to make a class. It's the same thing in Java, but everything needs to be in a class, so that's what it is there. And then we see that public thing. Public is another keyword, but we don't we haven't used public in in Python. Python kind of like didn't really have this as a as a as a main feature of the language. There were conventions we would follow, for example, remember how <laughs> like here's a class for a it looks like a student object, right? They have a first name, a last name, a student number, and a current average, right? So they all start with an underscore. And if you remember, the underscore was a convention to follow that meant, you know, this is a, this is a field that belongs to this instance of the class. So if I'm making a student object, that student object has a first name, last name, etc. But these values really are not intended to be accessed elsewhere. They exist within the class and they can be used within the class, but they're really not supposed to be used elsewhere. There was nothing actually preventing you, though, in Python from accessing them elsewhere. It's just, if you were, you were breaking the convention. And if things didn't have the underscore, they were public. If they did have the underscore, they're private. You leave them alone. If they're not private, they're public, they're accessible by anyone anywhere. In Java, you specify if you want it, you, you explicitly specify with keywords, public and private. And if something's private, not only, like it's not that it's oh, a convention, you're not supposed to access this elsewhere, it's you can't, Java won't let you. If you try to, the program won't even run. This right now, I can talk at you about what this means, and until you actually see it, it won't be that clear. And so once we start doing this in practice, I'll make it very clear as we go. All of the things I'm about to say are all going to be fairly, like I'll describe them right now, but I'm not expecting you to listen to me and be like, okay, I'll remember this forever. No, just be aware of it, and then when it comes up again, we'll make sure it sticks. So I'm just letting you know some of these things, just so these keywords aren't meaningless to you as we start. Static, when a static uh, function or variable is declared, it means that that thing doesn't belong to an instance of that class. It belongs to that class. And this is kind of hard to explain, but 
Remember how, like, if I had some class, if I had a method inside a, this is, yeah, Java code, but this is what it means. If I had an object and I wanted to make a new instance of an object in Python, I'm doing that on line five in Java. Very similar syntax. The variable name, and then the class name over here, it's called some class. And then if I wanted to call a method, I would say, well, the name of my instance, I had, there I call it an instance, dot the method name, right? I have to tell an instance of that object to do something. But sometimes we want functionality, or variables, or data, you know, to be in the class, but not really belong to any one instance of that, of that class. It doesn't really make sense to be part of the object. So when something is declared static, that's what we're trying to achieve. If I had some method that was defined static, I would call it on the name of the class, not the instance of the class. Not an instance of the class like I'm doing here, where I made an instance of a sum class and then called some method. Again, if this makes sense to you, you're ahead of the curve. If this doesn't make sense to you, you're exactly where I expect you to be right now. It'll make more sense as we go. Void, this is the return type. If we go up here, we see, right? These are very strongly typed languages. You need to be very explicit about what the type of things are. So if I have a function, and that function takes two integers, I need to say, you take two integers. If I want to make a variable for integers, I have to say, you are a variable for integers. Functions have a return value, and the, not all of them, right? They can return nothing. But if you have a function that's returning a value, well, that value has a type. And you actually must specify the type to be returned in the signature of your function, the signature being that like first line. So here, this is a method named main, and its return type is void. Void is the keyword you use when you're not actually going to return anything. There's no return in there. Uh, static, void, main, very special function. It's the first thing that's run. String args. I kind of showed you this, but you're the only one that'll this make any sense to. Right here. These are the parameters for this function. Now, the main method, often you'll see, regardless of the programming language, you'll see something that looks like this, string args. So there is a parameter named args. That's the name for arguments, it's called. But it has a type. We have to specify the type of the, that parameter, because it's Java. And the type is string array. It's an array because we have the square brackets. You'll remember the square brackets from lists in Python. Lists are very similar at a superficial level to arrays, but there's a big difference that we'll see as we go. Arrays are more primitive than lists. Lists are actually fairly big, sophisticated data structures. So this is basically saying, you can think of it in the context of what you're used to from Python, this is a function that takes a list of strings. Really, it's, it's an array of strings, but you could think of it as a list of strings. And what's neat about this is, typically the way you start a program these days is you, you double click it on your desktop or something, right? And it just runs. But you know, if it's 1982 and you're running your program, here, let's see. Okay, I'm, I'm using PowerShell right now. Can you see this reasonably okay at the back? No? We'll sit closer next time. Let's see if I can make it bigger quickly here. Uh, edit. Properties. Font. There, it's probably much better, right? There we go, okay, cool. So I have a program, ls. Hmm. LS is a program, and I called it from a command line. This is like I'm using a computer back in 1982 or whatever, right? So 
I called the program ls. That's how I ran it. So when I ran this code, I see what it produced in terms of output. And when I ran it, it, the first line of code that it ran inside that program was the main method. I'm, I'm guessing, I'm not 100% sure, I'm guessing this program was written in C or something, right? But sometimes when I'm running the program, I want to have different like settings for that program. Now, I don't know if this is going to work too well right now, because it's on Windows. No, that didn't work. Mm. Shoot. Dur. Well, this isn't going to work too well, but pretend I was on Linux. <laughs> and I pressed ls-l. That's an option. That's, that, that's an argument I'm actually giving to the program. So you know how when you have a function, to make your function more general, you give it parameters. I don't want to add the same two numbers together every time. I want to add this number and that number. So I give that function two parameters, and it works on those two values. Well, those parameters that you give to the main method is a way to give parameters to your whole program. So when I call the program, I can actually start to specify specific options and settings for that program on the command line. So that's what that is. The dash L would be one of the args in that list of strings. That's what it is. Cool. And what else? And oh, the squiggles. We call them bracers. Every open needs a close. Everything after this is in the sum class class until it's closed. This is inside the main method, which is inside the sum class class, right? So open close, that's how we do it in Java and a lot of other similar languages like C, 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 Sharp, etc., JavaScript. That's fairly common. Python's the weird one here. In fact, the white space stuff that Python does, like how everything's indented, uh, the, the white space is very functionally important for Python. If you didn't have the, the indentation right, it won't work right, right? Uh, that's actually something a lot of experienced programmers don't like about Python, is that. Uh, I think I was saying last time, <clears throat> technically, the spacing in Java is not needed. All of this could actually be on one line of code, and it'll work. Don't do it. Everyone will hate you. You still do the indentation because it's the convention. Your IDE is going to even help you do it. But it's not functionally required like it is in Python, which is kind of neat. Any questions? I will, one sec. I'm just going to re-emphasize everything I just said. You are, I'm not expecting you to leave today's lecture going, I understand completely now. No, absolutely not. I'm just letting you know that these words have meaning and they'll come up more as we go. Yeah, what's up? It won't work, yeah. And we'll see many examples of that. Now, for the command line arguments, it can read everything as a string. I would just, as the programmer, have to know, OK, if I see this, it actually should be read as a, as a number, and so I can pa parse it and cast it as such. But yeah. What's up? Um, so why would you like, void your like, class in the first place? Like, what is the point? Of well, void doesn't mean it's like, a re it just means this method isn't returning a value. That's what it means. And this will probably make more sense once we write a function that does return a value, and you'll see, oh, OK. Yeah. Void doesn't mean, like, ignore this. It means this is a function, and it's never going to give me any information back. That's all it means. Other questions? All right. Next topic. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go side by side showing you some examples of code in Python and how we would do the same thing in Java. For the most part, it's fairly straightforward. You will notice there's a lot of more, Java tends to be more verbose, which is actually a good thing a lot of times. But one thing to keep in mind before I start going through this is you have to remember each programming language, especially when we're talking about like the more popular ones, they all have their own strengths and weakness. Some programming languages were designed with a specific thing in mind. 
Right? Python's this nice, lightweight scripting language, even though it's not really lightweight in any way. But it's, you know, it's a scripting language, quick and easy, you do stuff, right? But it's not really, and I want to be clear, what I'm about to say is not, like, I'm not speaking in absolutes. You can do whatever you want. But, you know, people probably aren't sitting down and making these big, giant software seats to run on, like, enterprise systems in Python. You could. But you're probably using a language like C++ or maybe Java or something like that. So like each language has their own like niche, right? One thing Java was not designed for was a lot of like standard input output. Like writing a program to say like, tell me your name. Like, My name is James, right? Like Java wasn't like, that's really not, it, it can do it. But that wasn't really what it was for, right? Python, on the other hand, I mean, it's not for reading you like silly little what's your name, but it definitely has more of that easiness, and we'll see as we go. So this is Hello World we saw last time. Hello World. It looks like, yeah, Java's way more verbose just to do Hello World, but really the line of code, there's really only one line of code that matters in the Hello World in Java, and it's line three. They're both one line. It's just... Java requires more for any program to get running. Variables and types. So if I'm in, if I'm in uh, Python and I want to make an, an, a variable called an int, store the number 5, I just do it. An int equals 5. Awesome. A float equals 5.5. Great. A string is 5. Whatever. Obviously, the names of these variables, as you remember, don't really matter. I just named them this just to let you know. But there we go. And something that's kind of interesting in, Java, in Python is I could take the, the variable a string and put the number 77 in it after, and it's going to be fine, right? Now, if I wanted to make a couple variables in Java, I can't do something like an int equals 5. No, I need to tell Java, I'm making an integer variable called an int, and it has the value 5. I have to specify the type. And if you think for a moment that's going to be annoying, it's not. I know you might think, like, does that mean I'm more restricted in how I can? No, it's not. You're not going to be limited. So don't worry about that right now. You just have to specify the type. but you only specify the type when you declare it first. Once it's created, you can use it however you want. You just don't need to re-specify the type. You only specify the type when you're making it the first time. I'll show you an example of that very shortly. If I want to float, we use the word double for float, typically. You can use the word float. It's just actually limited and it's much more limited in how big the number can be. Float is double precision. There's, the numbers can be bigger, FYI. Typically, we're going to use the word double. And I'm storing the value 5.5. Double is a float. String, well, I have to say it's a string. And character, there's actually another primitive type here in Java that you don't really see very often. I'm just showing you here to let you know it exists. I can make a character, its type is char for character, but you'll notice that it actually uses single quotes instead of double quotes. Single quotes is, means it's a character. If it's double quotes, it's going to think it's the single letter or single like symbol five, but it's still a string. You're not really going to see character very often. I'm just letting you know, you know, there we go, it exists. Any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, the argument there, the name of that parameter, args, is not, like, it's not used anywhere. It's just there. At the very top, you mean this? <laughs> Think of, like, a function and how, like, I have parameters in there, but I'm just not using the parameter. Just ignore it. Effectively, I'm saying ignore this for now. It's... A lot of the code you write, I don't think, you, I'm not even sure you write any code in this whole semester where you're actually going to use those. You just have to have them there. A good eye. But the fact that that's a string, 
and the other variable, they are entirely independent from one another. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very good observation, and there is a very good reason for it. And in fact, you might be able to guess why, but first let's talk about some convention here. You will notice in Python we use, uh, what do they call it, snake case. If you've got, I, I made a variable called an int, so it's an underscore int. The convention in Java is you use camel case, like that, an int. No underscore, you always start with a lowercase, and any subsequent word starts with an uppercase. Right? So an int, a float, a string, a character. Right? So far so good? So, but that convention was still followed in Python. Your variables, whatever, they start with like lowercase. But do you remember the convention for classes whenever you made a class? It always starts with an uppercase. Same thing in Java. So, Int double char, they are just the type, and they are primitive types. Int double char, they're just, they're just like numbers, a double, an individual character. A boolean would be lowercase, a bool would be lowercase too. But strings are a little different. You remember in Python too, strings were like, you know, they're different. It's actually like a sequence of data, a string of data. And because it's more sophisticated than just your regular integer, your float, your Boolean, your character, there's a little bit more there, and it's actually a collection. It's a whole class. So there's a class called string that defines strings, where int, double, and char aren't classes. But, now this, this will come up later. I'm just going to answer it now because it came up. There are class, there are object versions of the primitive types called integer, starting with an uppercase i. Double, uppercase D, character for character, and Boolean for Boolean. And they, uh, they're the object version of the primitive types. And there's a reason we have them, and we'll talk about that later. So the reason string starts with an uppercase is because it's, the type is uppercase string as written by following the convention that all classes start with an uppercase. But int, double, and char right there aren't classes, they're primitive types. This distinction will come up more. In Python, this distinction doesn't really exist. It kind of does, it kind of doesn't. Uh, so we kind of missed it. But in a lot of languages, your int, double, and char, they're all stored in these nice, like, I, I need eight bytes to store this information. And so I know I have uh, 8, 16, 24, 32, 64 bits, 64 zeros and ones I can represent that, like, we know really nice things about it. And what's kind of funny is you could take an integer and be like, if I have the integer like 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and I say decode that as an integer, it'll tell you what it is as an integer. But decode it as a string or as a character, it'll tell you, oh, that's the letter, whatever. So it's actually kind of, the types are there. The encoding is the same. The decoding is different. Right? So the zeros and ones are the same. The encoding. If I have an integer and I want to encode it in binary, I encode it, the integer this way and I decode it the inverse. Uh, a character could get encoded to the same zeros and ones, but they have different meanings based on the encoding and decoding process. But that's not that important right now. I just answered it because why not? Other questions about this? Very good eye on that one. But the uppercase S. All right. Uh, okay, let me make sure I hit these things. We must declare variables with their types. We use the word double instead of float. You could use float, but it only uses four bytes. Double takes up eight. Double the amount. It's called double. Uh, we use double quotes for strings. That does mean uh, that does mean that we have a new type character like this. Slash slash for comments. Unlike Python, we use the hash. Oh, and every line of code must end in a semicolon. You could add semicolons in Python, but they're not needed. We often don't. Uh, okay, going forward, this public class, some class, and public static void main string args, I'm saying here, I'm not going to include them in the code blocks for brevity. They're all going to have them. Just I'm not going to include them in the examples just because otherwise it just gets too big. Cool? Oh, so far so good, yeah. Uh, 
Yes. So in Python, I could do that. I can make a variable, throw an int in there, and then two seconds later, take that variable and override it with the string totally not five, and it's fine. In Python, or in Java, it ain't gonna work. Not only will it not work, it won't even run. So it's not a case of, oh, it runs and crashes. Java will be like, no, no, I can't do that. You can't put a string in an integer. Someone's messed up somewhere. Your code says this is a variable to store an integer. And for some reason, there's other code that's trying to put a string into it. Something's wrong. Fix it. And you, if you're thinking for a second, okay, it's being more restrictive and it's mean about what it lets you do, you're thinking about this the wrong way. This is actually doing you a huge favor. This is eliminating potential bugs, type errors, before they could ever happen. It's better to have broken code not run with silent errors. No. It's be I went with like a double negative, now I'm confused. It's better to have broken code not run. If you have broken code that runs and you don't notice there's an issue, there's a problem. So this actually helps eliminate potential issues before they even happen. This is a good thing. We love this. And Python doesn't give you this. Python gives you a lot of rope that you're going to trip on. Java is very restrictive, but you're not going to trip on that rope. It's nice. Uh, <clears throat> so. Here we go. I want to make a variable, another int, put the value 11 in there, great, I print it out, great. Technically in Java, there's two steps that you can do in one line, but there are two steps. On line one, over there, int equals another int, sorry, int, another int, I'm making the variable another int, and its type is int. That's just the declaration. This is me telling Java, hey Java, I'm making a variable called another int and its type is int. The next line is saying, okay, now put the value 11 in it. Notice on line two, I didn't need to specify the type anymore. Once it's declared, it's fine. Java knows. So I didn't need to say int another int, int another int equals 11. It's just, I only needed the type when it was declared. But as we saw on the previous example, you can do the declaration and assignment in one line. That's entirely fine. Or you can do them separate. That's entirely fine. But again, see how here obviously this code isn't going to work so I'm going to try to put a string in there. But I, I still don't need to specify the type after it's been declared. It only needs to be defined, declared once and then, it, then you're set. <clears throat> yeah, so this is saying, I could do this all on one line of code. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that there really are two separate steps involved. The declaration and then the assignment. Any questions? Now, if, if you don't have questions, that's fine. But remember, I get really bored if people don't ask questions. So you got to ask. Yes? It really will depend on the situation. At the end of the day, really, no. Most of the time, like when we're dealing with classes and making objects, you're going to do declarations outside of it. No. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's the better answer. Do whatever you like. Other questions? You absolutely can reuse variables as long as the types are the same. So if we look at the Python example here, a is 5, print a plus 2, b equals a plus 7, print out b, b is now equal to b plus 1. But I'm reusing the variable b a bunch here. And here, on the, in the Java example, I'm doing the exact same thing. But of course, I have to specify the types when the variable is declared. So only on lines 1 and 4 do I actually specify int because on line one, while well, the variable a is being declared and assigned. And then on line four, the variable b is being declared and assigned. 
But on lines 7 and 10, I don't need to specify int. It's only when it's declared. And I can reuse these variables all I want as long as the types are the same. And then it's happy. <clears throat> so, and, and like take a moment and like look at this code. Look how similar this code is. The key difference is I need to specify the type. And the syntax for how I print is different. Semicolons. The biggest difference is the fact that I have to specify the type, though. That's it. Yeah? So uh, <clears throat> if you could write all of that Java stuff on one line, how would you figure out where the semicolons go? They would be, the semicolon would be after, so the semicolon doesn't end a line, it ends like a statement. So if I were to write this on one line, and I'm answering this for pure academic reasons, in practice, don't do this. It, the, line, the one line would be int a equals 5 semicolon system.out.print line. So the semicolons end a statement. It's just often we put one statement per line, and we put the semicolons at the end of the statement, so it looks like it's the end of each line. But it's not really quite the, right, because there are a lot of cases where we don't add semicolons in Java, because it's not really the end of a full state. You, you'll see. Uh, t -t now, here I showed an example of reusing a variable. And often, new programmers, they, they, get, they get misguided on what good code means. And if you remember from 161 for me, good code is understandable code, right? So if you look at, oh, okay, I could reuse variables, that's good. If I can solve a problem with one variable instead of two variables, that's better. I'm using less space, right? Which, okay, sure, that might be true. But if that means your code becomes less understandable as a result of using one variable instead of two, that's a bad thing. Especially because, remember, code is not for computers. It's for humans. Byte code is for computers. That's the code that when you go to run your code, the, J the JDK looks at your code, converts it into effectively the zeros and ones that run on your computer. Those zeros and ones are for the computer. Code is for humans. You write your code to be as understandable as possible. And if you think you're losing speed because of it, often that process of, of Java going, okay, I'm going to take your code and turn it into something the computer likes, that software will optimize your code for you. The zeros and ones, if I were to do a pure translation of my code from Java to the zeros and ones, or do like Java, do your thing, and have it do its translation, it's going to be wildly different. Because Java knows better. Java knows how to optimize what's actually going to get run on your computer. So the code you write is not necessarily exactly what's going to run on your computer. It's deterministic, don't get me wrong, being like there, there will be a mapping. But don't worry too crazy much about optimizing. Now, we did learn in 161, like if, remember with searching, right? Remember with a linear search. Worst case scenario, if I have n things in my collection, how many things do I have to look at? n, all of them. But remember, binary search was different. Binary search was better. If you remember, it was log n, log base 2 of n. Every time I doubled the size of the input with a linear search, I doubled the amount of work I had to do. I have twice as many things to look at, I have twice as many things to look at. But with a binary search, it was different. If I doubled the input size, I only had to look at one more thing, which is way better. So that type of optimization, yeah, that matters. But when it comes down to things like, I saved a variable, but your code became less understandable, don't do it. So I'm saying we can reuse variables. Yeah, that's great, but that doesn't mean you're going to be doing that a lot. Like, that, that's not an expectation. Often you're reusing variables for like counters and loops and whatnot, 
or maybe if you have like a running total variable or something, yeah. But in general, this isn't something that you should be like hyper trying to do, right? If you need the variable again, great. If you don't, make a new variable. There's nothing wrong with making new variables if you need them. Constants. Remember constants, right? Here's how we did it in Python, right? If I had a constant, a constant is a great way to do a couple of things. One, it's a great way to have like a variable, like if I have a, if I have a bunch of code that's calculating like bills of stuff, maybe there's like billions of lines of code, and suddenly the government comes and changes the tax rate to 11%, I don't know. I only need to change one line of code, line one, that constant, right? If I'm using that variable throughout. That's awesome. But another thing too is, it's a great way to give a, a name to a value. If I have a bunch of code and I'm always multiplying something by 1.15, if I'm aware that it's like sales tax, sure I know what it is, but if I show it to some arbitrary other programmer and they're gonna see why, like what's 1.15? What is that? Why is 1.15 in here all the time? What's going on? But if they see sales tax all the time, they're going to go, oh, it's sales tax. So it's a great way, a constant is a great way to give a name to a value. But you remember in Python, you know, with a variable, with, a, with your general variable, you can assign it a value, and your code could change the value of that variable whenever you want. But constants, the idea of the constant was you set it, that you write your code, but your code is never going to touch that value. It can access it, but it's never going to change it. It's constant. So you leave it alone. But in Python, nothing actually stopped you from changing it. You could write code that changes the value of a constant. If you did, you're an asshole and you shouldn't do it. You're breaking the convention. But you, the, the convention to let other programmers know that this value is a constant is, all uppercase, snake case, if you have changes in variables, it's not going to change. Let me see if I can show you an example really quick, actually. <clears throat> I'm going to go to Colab to show you what I mean in Python and how we can change it. In here, let's go. Hmm. Here, I'm just going to go in here for a moment. This is going to get deleted, but so collab will load. Okay. So if I say uh, and I hit run, Python's going to do exactly what you'd expect it to do. But you as a programmer know, well, you messed with that constant, and you shouldn't have. But Python doesn't stop you. Python's like, you're in charge, do what you want. In Java, the convention is the same. Uppercase snake case for your constants. And we need the type, but we put this special keyword in front of it, final. And when something is declared final, Java won't let you change it. Look. Even IntelliJ, it's not even, it's not even, so this isn't Java, this is IntelliJ. If I were to hit run on this, Java is going to be like, I can't build this project. You're breaking the rules. Let me show you. Run, run, and it's going to say, what is it actually going to tell me here? <clears throat> Come on, wake up. Error, cannot assign a value to a final variable sales tax. It's saying, you can't do it. You told me that this variable was final, meaning it's a constant. You can't change it. You told me it was final. 
and then somewhere else in the code it got changed. Something is wrong. Either you didn't mean to make it final, and that's fine, just change your code. Or you did mean to make it final, change your code. There's an issue with the code, and it won't even run. This wasn't a case of the program running and crashing, so the program didn't even start. So there's a moment in time where the program starts running and then it might crash, right? Maybe it'll finish, maybe it'll crash, who knows? This happened before that. This was compile time. This was Java converting your code to something it can run, and it went, nope, can't do it. But even more, this is IntelliJ now. This isn't Java, this is the IDE, because the IDE is smart enough to know that you made a mistake. So even IntelliJ is like, you can't do that, stop it. So Java actually gives you more control over this data. It's final. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. And that is awesome. We love it. It's fine in Python that you can actually change it as long as everyone's following the convention. But now this is actually, it forces you, which is kind of nice. <clears throat> Now, arrays. Java, unlike Python, Java doesn't give you lists out of the box. Java gives you something called arrays. And arrays are going to be very similar to lists at a superficial level. There's a lot of differences. But a couple of things to note about arrays is they store data in a linear sequential fashion like a list. You know, there's something at index 0, something at index 1, something at index 2. But they have a fixed size. If I make an array of size 5 and I try to add a sixth thing to it, it's not going to work. Where in Python with a list, you could just keep appending, right? You can append forever. Now, if you were to go into Python's list and crack the hood open, you're going to find arrays underneath. They're built on top of arrays. I'm pretty sure maybe it's a link structure. I don't know. We'll see more of this as we go in the semester. But arrays are more primitive, for lack of a better term. In many other programming languages, you're not getting lists out of the box like you are with Python. You're getting arrays. Oh, and arrays have very few built-in functions that you were used to in Python's lists. But here's an example of me creating some, some list in Python. A list 10, 11, 12, 13. If I wanted to access the thing at index 1, what value is at index 1 of that list? It's a quiz. 11. 11. Not 10? No, because we start counting at 0, which makes more sense, because it's all about offsets. Remember, go to the beginning of that list, or array, and take 0 steps. Where am I? Still at the beginning. That's why, remember that. Remember, you'll, you won't forget if you remember why. And then I say, OK, a list at index 11 is 21. I print it out, whatever. That, like, that's going to work just fine in Python. In Java, here's how I do it. I specify it's an integer array. So the squares, it's what is the type of the variable an array? It's an integer array. So the squares go next to the type because it's part of the type. That variable isn't an integer. It's an integer array. So the type is integer array int square brackets. The square brackets means array. And instead of square brackets here, though, we use the squiggles, the braces. But here's how I make an inline array with the values 10, 11, 12, 13. I can access it. I can change the value. This code, assigned for how it's declared and what it really is, would function the same if I were to run them. They would do the same thing. So with the exception of like the type syntax in here, uh, da -da. one difference is, yeah, in, with lists, you could have different types in the lists. Just by nature of how Python, you can change the variables of types, what, whatever. Java, no. If I make an integer array and I try to put a string in there, it ain't going to work. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an array for integers only. In the same way that I can't make an integer variable and put a string in it. Just can't do it. <clears throat> okay, and the one big thing is the array, 
this array will always be size 4. I can't make it bigger. There's no way for me to take this array and make it bigger. It's always size 4. Tough. Deal with it. But we have a way to pretend that it's getting bigger that we'll see soon. But it is stuck to be size 4. It's fixed length. That's it. The end. In Python, you wanted to add more? Append. Great. Now it's got five things in it. You're fine. Yeah. This also means that you can't start, like in Python, if you wanted a list, keep an eye on the time, to start empty and then I can like build a list, like for example, I want the list, the list starts empty and then I keep appending the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to, I guess, 999. This list gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as it goes, right? If I wanted to do the same thing in Java, and you're thinking, well, if it's fixed size, how do I do this? Well, you create the array with a thousand spots, and then you go populate it. That's how you'd get around it. This can be variable. You can, so see how like on line two, it's new int of size 1,000? This could be variable. Like you could ask the user, how big do you want the array to be? And you could be like 77. And it'll be like, okay, I'll make an array of size 77. So it is dynamic in that sense. In other languages, no. In other languages, if you want to make a basic array, I'm not going to get into it. There's differences here. But you need to know how big you want your array to be at compile time, not run time. Meaning, that line of code, 1,000, every time I hit run, that array is going to be size 1,000. But there are some programming languages, depending on how you do things, if I try to make it variable, it won't work. Because the computer wouldn't know how much memory it needs until it's running where the computer likes to know how much memory it's going to need before it runs. So it can get kind of, here, I'm explaining this poorly, and I don't want to explain it anymore anyways, so we'll move on. Yes? So you're creating basically an empty array? Well, it's an array with a thousand spots in it with nothing in it. Okay, so it just has nothing. Well, it will have with default, with primitive types, it'll have their default value in Java. Other languages aren't necessarily the same, like in C++. It'll just set aside chunks of RAM, and whatever zeros and ones are in the RAM are what's in that memory location, at that index. In Java, on the other hand, when you make an integer one, everything will start with value zero. If you make it with some objects, though, I'm pretty sure it's all null. But we're going to get there. Good question, though. Other questions? Yes? Can you add to it, like, can you add to a string? Like append to it? Yeah. No. They are, strings are immutable. But we have ways around it. Remember, like, strings were, so if you're thinking for a moment, that sounds really annoying. I'm definitely more limited. But remember how in Python, strings were immutable. You couldn't make a string bigger, but we had a trick. If you really wanted that string to be bigger, you couldn't, but you just made a new one based on the old one that was bigger. That's what we're going to do in, that, in Java. So it's the same thing. Right, so it's not actually nothing crazy new. You've already kind of familiar with this idea, but we'll see it a little bit more rigorous as we go. Great question, though. Great question. Uh, ah, here's an example of a for loop. I th I'm pretty sure I hit it harder, a little lower, but here's an example of a for loop in, in Java. In Python, this is more in line with like a for each loop, for each thing in a collection of thing. This is a more like, like a counting for loop. And the syntax might throw you off, but here's what it means. For some integer i starting at 0. I'm looking at the Java side on line 5. So I'm making a variable called i, but it's Java. I have to specify the type. It's integer. And what's it going to start at? 0. Go until or go while this condition is true. So it's kind of like a while loop in that sense. Well, i is less than an array dot length. Arrays know how big they are in Java. Other languages, no. 
But in Java, you can ask an array how big it is. Similar in Python, you could ask how big a list was by saying size. But size was actually a magic method, and you'd call it by saying size. You called it as if size was a function. This is actually an attribute, a field of the array, you, where you would actually just say, OK, array.length, right? It's not a function. It's not nothing. You're good to go. Any last questions? <laughs> we could have made it more awkward, but whatever. All right, no last questions, no nothing. Have a great weekend. <laughs>